This morning's scripture lessons come from the Psalms. The first is from Psalm 63, verses 3 and 4. Because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live, and in your name I will lift up my hands. And from Psalm 28, verses 1 and 2, to you, Lord, I call. You are my rock. Do not turn a deaf ear to me, for if you remain silent, I will be like those who go down to the pit. Hear my cry for mercy as I call to you for help, as I lift up my hands towards your most holy place. It's God's word. Let's pray. Well, Heavenly Father, just as the psalmist, we lift our hands and hearts to you. To you, Heavenly Father, mood of thanksgiving continues today as we stay focused on you, gratefully praising you for the gift of life, the gift of faith, the gift of Jesus, and our walk with him each day. Our walk is through a fallen world. There seems to be chaos everywhere. There are many who feel helpless and in despair. However, you, Lord, have given us the heart to look to you. We look to you in your word, and there we find answers. Your presence is always there for us through prayer, and there we find strength, peace, and joy. You have, through Jesus, given us the gift of fellowship and hearts for worship as we gather here in your name. We pray restoration of hearts throughout the Holy Spirit everywhere. And for us, we raise up to you our family and friends with needs. Especially we want to pray for Ethel Renfro and Stan Weeby, Held Elmer, Earl Peterson, and Earl and Donna Olson. And the persecuted Christians everywhere and the people of Israel as well as those who are shut-ins and unable to be with us and for those serving in the military. We thank you for the wonderful opportunity to support missions and missionaries here and throughout the world, especially Kubali Khandit with Ethos 360. Now we continue lifting our hands and hearts to you as we join in the prayer that our Lord Jesus taught us to pray together. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. In my cynical way, I have suggested that in many cases, people rush past Thanksgiving to get to Christmas, and we forget to give thanks. Give thanks, and we do that in a number, a number of ways. When you and I communicate with one another, we do it through a, a number of mechanisms. We don't just use words. We communicate when we're talking to someone with the expression on our face. A scowl while you're saying, I really do love you. <laughs> or I'm so happy I, can, I could just cry. It doesn't communicate what really been, is going on, does it? We communicate with our expressions on our face. We communicate. In fact, I, I, I've known a couple of people that if you tied their hands behind their back, they couldn't utter a, a, an intelligible sentence because you know, everything was with, with their hands. And even with our posture, we communicate with one another. And I think, it's, I think it's true as well when we communicate with God. It entails more than just words, saying the right words. 
Many of you know that Ernestine and I spent the last 13 years of our life in Tennessee. And it was interesting when you would hear people speaking perfectly good Southern English, and when they started praying, it was all automatically King James. Thus thou, therefores, and these, they, they prayed in King James. Somehow that was more spiritual, I think. And I really do think that God pays attention to how we communicate with him. I'm not really sure that the inflection of our voice or the expression of our, our face he pays a lot of attention to, but I'm absolutely certain that the transparency of our heart he does pay attention to. Whether we're, when we're genuinely sincere or we lack sincerity when we communicate, I think God pays close attention to that. And so this morning I'd like to take just a couple of minutes and talk to us about the nonverbal dimensions of our prayers. Not what we say, not the words, but how it is that we pray. Because I think that uh, they do communicate something, not only to ourself, but they communicate to the Lord. For instance, in the scriptures, as you read, there's a lot of prayers in the scriptures, Old and New Testament. In fact, I have a book in my library that is, that is dedicated just solely to the prayers found in the scriptures. And it, it's not a pamphlet, it's a, it's a fair-sized book that just relates just to the prayers. And if you will notice as you're reading those prayers out of the scriptures, the people uttering those prayers were not detached from the words they were saying. In fact, many of the prayers that you will find in the scriptures are accompanied by weeping, by prayer, by tears. And then there are prayers that are accompanied with songs and with praise and with thanksgiving. In fact, in Psalm 39, verses 1, verses 12 says, Hear my prayer. It was read to you. Hear my prayer, O Lord. Listen to my cries for help. Be not deaf to my weeping. And then there's in another passage in, passage in Psalm 6, verses 6 and 7. It is a prayer that is written out of a troubled heart, a troubled soul. I am worn out from groaning all night long. I flood my bed with weeping and drench my couch with tears. My eyes grow weak with sorrow. And if you'll recall, Jeremiah, the Old Testament prophet, is referred to as the weeping prophet. And he didn't get that from laughing all the time. Apparently, he wept over the sins of Israel. He wept because of their rejection of God's word. He wept before the Lord, tears of sorrow because of what he was witnessing in, in his day. Sorrow and mourning, tears, find a way of expression, expressing our concerns, and it was much used by the ancients. Years ago, before Ernestine and I were married, that was a long time ago, I was just a wee tot then. <laughs> One of the ladies in the church, our home church, uh, Lois Bouchard, was diagnosed as cancer, and it was so far advanced that she was said that she had but months to live. And as far as I can recall, it's the first time in that church in, in our history that someone in our congregation was diagnosed with something really serious. I don't even remember someone in that church dying at that, at, up to that point. But Lois Bouchard was a faithful servant of the Lord. She had a little boy named Randy. Her husband was, uh, was a non-believer. And her heart's desire, she said, if God doesn't heal me, please, Lord, let me live long enough to see Randy graduate from high school. And he was in grade school. The congregation began to pray for Lois. And in fact, our pastor at the time, he called several late into the night prayer meetings. The women would meet one night and the men would come to the church the next night. And we prayed late into the night for her heart's desire. Lord, if you are not going to heal her, please let her live long enough to see Randy graduate from high school. Long story short, the Lord did indeed grant her wish. She saw Randy graduate from high school. She suffered, a lot. She suffered during those years a lot of, of treatments. This was back in the in the early 60s, so there was a lot of things going on. And it was during that, that, those nights of prayer, as a, as a young man, I heard men in our church begin to weep on behalf of Lois Bushard that I had never seen a tear in their eye at all. It became a, a, a passion for this congregation. Lord, 
touch this woman, let her live long enough, and indeed she did. She lived long enough to see Randy graduate from high school, but I want you to know that men in Chicago on many occasions wept as they prayed for her because we wanted to see God touch her and to answer her prayers. Singing is a, is a way of, of praying. It's one of the ways I pray. Now, I don't know about you, but if I get on my knees or I sit down wherever I am and I start praying, my mind goes here and my mind goes there. Every conceivable stupid thing that has nothing to do with what I'm trying to pray comes to my mind. So I sing. I sing prayers. And fortunately, we in our hymnals have a great source of material to focus our attention. Praying a song, singing a song unto the Lord as worship it is discipline and it focuses us. It allows us to focus on what we are doing. And your hymnal has a lot of songs that were originally, they were prayers. And many of them are directed directly to God himself. And so to sing a hymn, to sing a prayer unto the Lord gives us both direction and focus. Years ago... Uh, I went to, with 11 of our men from, from Chandler and the church in Chandler, I don't know, with Steve, you went to the Promise Keepers Conference over in Los Angeles. And we were in that great uh, football field. It seats, I don't know, 100,000 people, but there were 72,000 men in that football stadium for a couple of days and nights, and we sang. And I, I don't know how to explain to you the, 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 the sense of awe to be standing in the middle of 72,000 men singing, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord God Almighty. I mean, the hair on the back of your neck and on your arms would rise. When we stood there and we sang to the Lord, Great is thy faithfulness. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. We were focused. The leaders of that conference focused us to sing prayers. I mean, if we all began to pray out loud, a lot of the guys weren't accustomed to that. That would have been a confusing thing. But to be able to sing, great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness, it was a praise. It was a thanksgiving. It was, a, it was an expression of our hearts. And I personally, I, I, I'm not a, a, usually a very emotional person but it, there, there were emotions that rose up within me during those, those songs that I, that I had not experienced before. And it enabled me to worship God in a way that I was not accustomed to. Pray, singing and praising God is a wonderful way to focus. It's a great vehicle to be able to be directed on how we can sing and pray to the Lord. Kneeling was a common practice in the old days, in, in, ancient, in ancient days. People of low esteem were expected to kneel before a, a monarch and to fail. It was a sign of humility. It was a sign of respect. And if you refused to do so, it was the height of, of rebellion. It was the height of defiance. God is our sovereign. And, I, and I, you're thinking to yourself, well, I can't, get down. I can't get down on my knees. Well, I can get down. I, I can't hardly get up. But kneeling before the Lord it is a sign of humility. It is a sign of acknowledging his sovereignty. He is the monarch. He is the sovereign God. The scripture refers to him as Lord of lords and King of kings. And so our kneeling before the Lord is a wonderful way of focusing our attention. The pain in our knees will focus our attention on what, on what we're doing before, before the Lord. The psalmist 95 says, come let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our God. And there are other passages that suggest that kneeling before the Lord is an appropriate posture. And the question is, why is that, why is that appropriate? And the answer is that approaching God is a privilege. It is not an earned right. It is a privilege to kneel before the Lord. It is a privilege to approach God. There are so many People who don't have any idea of what it means to approach God personally and individually and, and, very, and very directly. There's another means of, of, uh, of prayer, of, of expressing our prayer, and that is the lifting up of our hands. We've got a few people here that do that, and I'm, I'm so pleased. King Solomon, when he was dedicating the temple that was, that was built in honor of God, they built a platform on which King Solomon could be above the people and then they could all see him. 
And here was this monarch, the wisest man on earth, one of the richest men ever to live, got down on his knees and raised his hands and he began to pray and to honor, and to honor God, First Corinthians. Uh, in, in Second Chronicles, and then the Apostle Paul writing to Timothy said, I want men everywhere to lift up holy hands in prayer. But can I get real personal here? There are many Christians today would rather take a beating with a baseball bat than to raise their hand in church unto the Lord. They'd rather be whipped than to do that. And the fact of the matter is, in, in the scripture days and what... What people are, are, are doing when they raise their hand, it is though we're taking all of our needs, all of our petitions, all of our cares, all of our requests to the Lord, and we are raising them as high towards him as possible. And by the way, the international symbol of surrender is what? Raising your hands and saying, I surrender. And it, it, it's, a little, it's a little difficult to sing, I surrender all. I surrender all, all to Jesus. I surrender all. Linda knows that that was not in tune, but <laughs> anyway. Another means of raising our hands unto the Lord is when we are, have an intense need. Listen to Psalm 28, 1 and 2. To you I call, O Lord, my rock. Do not turn a deaf ear to me. For if you remain silent, I will be like those who have gone down to the pit. Hear my cry for mercy as I call to you for help, as I lift my hands toward your most holy place. And so what am I saying? That we've got to lift our hands or get on our knees or sing? No, what I'm saying is that communicating to God is important. And I think he pays attention to the way that we do it. Sometimes we have to think a little bit outside the box. I remember reading many years ago of a young man who, who felt passionately that God had called him to go to South America as a missionary. That every door was shut to him. Every agency that he went to, he was either too young or he wasn't married or he didn't have a, hadn't raised enough money. He, he, all the doors were shut in front of him. And he was talking with his pastor, an, a, a, an aged pastor, sort of like me. And he was asking the pastor, why? I, I know God wants me to go. And the pastor asked him a rather poignant question. Have you gone as far as you can possibly go to fulfill this, this call? And he said, well, yeah, I think so. But that night, that question kept ringing in his head. Have you gone as far as you can possibly go to fulfill this call? And it occurred to him that he hadn't done so. The next day, he boarded a Greyhound bus. He traveled to Key West, Florida, went to the furthest part of the island, walked out into the water southward up to his chest. And he said, Father, I've gone as far as I can go. If you want me to go to South America to be a missionary, you're going to have to make the way. Two months later, he was on his way to South America, and he spent 35 years ministering to the indigenous people. Sometimes we have to think outside the box if we want to have the Lord hear our prayer and respond to us. D.L. Moody was approached by a woman who, uh, after one of his services, who asked him, she said, my husband is a drunk, I know he's going to hell, He's abusive to me and to the children. Would you pray that the Lord would save him? And to her utter astonishment, D.L. Moody said, no. No, you won't pray for my husband? Why? He said, you've just told me that your husband is bound for hell. And you're too dry-eyed. You're too dry-eyed. There was no deep concern other than he was a drunk on his way to hell. He was too eye dried. We need to learn to communicate with God. And however, you know, sitting in a chair comfortably because of our age is, is obviously an adequate way of praying to God. But one of the things that would help us, I think, begin to pray effectively is for us to find a need that warrants our tears. If we have a husband or a wife or children or grandchildren or great a neighbor who we know is without Jesus Christ, and we say, Lord, just, you know, Lord, save them. 
touch them without being deeply moved by the fact that they're on their way to hell, being too dry-eyed. I've tried to say to you this morning, this is not a big, big inspiring sermon, I guess, but I've tried to say to you this morning that in our prayers, and I know you pray, in our prayers we, we, we need to pay attention to not just the words we say, but how we say it. How we say it. I don't remember how I first told Ernestine that I loved her, but it was enough that it convinced her to marry me. So there must have been something in, in the words, in the, in the body language, in something. It wasn't just, hey, girl. <laughs> you know, I'll take you out of Georgia and bring you to Chicago and, you know, you'll, you'll lose your accent and all that stuff. No. But, but to, to, with, with a sense of passion, approach the God. Approach God for our needs. Approach him in song, approach him in reading the scriptures, reading God's word back to him and say, Lord, you have said you will do this. You have said you will do, and I'm holding you to your word. I know you don't lie. I know you don't change. James, in his writing in chapter four, verse eight said, draw near to the Lord and he will draw near to you. If in our praying we feel that we have, we're not as close to the Lord as we once were, the question is, who do you think moved? Who moved? God certainly hasn't moved, but it's us. Songs of praise and thanksgiving. Kneeling before the Lord and approach his throne humbly because he is sovereign. And he will respond. He will respond. Lord, we asked you a long time ago to forgive us our sin. And in some cases, we did so with tears. Sometimes, some cases we did it not real certain that, that you would, but we ask anyway, and you did and have. All of us in this room have concerns. All of us have people that we love. May prayer become a priority, not just a sideline but a priority in our life. It's not so much the King James or, or the articulateness as it is the transparency and the, and the passion of our heart that you're touched by. Help us, we, we, uh, help us be a praying people and a praying church, I thank you. In the name of Jesus, our Savior, amen. Would you stand with me and sing with me a song that we've been singing this month? Give thanks, give thanks.